the sounds I can hear. The birds that I can hear. All the different plants I can see that are making use of, of this really robust and um, permanent pond here. But then all the different species I see in the other little environments that are in the swampy meadow around, like the temporary, the femoral water bodies and just the moist boggy spots that it also supports. The smell of these environments is incredible. It just smells alive. And the coolness. If you walk through this environment on a stinking hot day, it just feels so, so much cooler than if you just walk slightly upslope uh, or, or if you look at the temperature for the day. It's got so much resilience about it and it's so robust. These sorts of environments are really what the Australian landscape is all about. <laughs> yeah, making use of what little water we've got. <laughs> yeah. Buffers, sponges and moderators. Three words that describe the amazing function that wetlands and boggy parts of our landscape provide for both environmental and productivity benefits. Parts of our farm that might sometimes be boggy, uh, sometimes feel a bit swampy, are actually really incredibly important. The fact that they wet and dry actually contributes to them being really important. So what we're doing now is going out and saying to people, well, are you interested in managing these parts of your farm as special, but integrated? So you can use them for stock from time to time, but you can also allow them to restore and heal and bring back wonderful diversity in these wet environments. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it was a, a source of annoyance and uh, a shame that you have a gully like that and uh, now it's all vegetated, uh, it's got water in it, we're going to be able to grow trees along it and uh, it will be very beautiful and more functional and useful. And I think the amount of extra feed we will get off that floodplain, even if it's only grazed a couple of times a year, would easily compensate and pay for the, for the earthworks that we did to produce it. We owned the place since this place for, since 2001 and we bought the block down the back where the uh, creek work's been done, we bought that in 2005-06. The two uh, portions down the back were first allocated in uh, 1872 to someone called Charles Hone who was a sawmiller and uh, true to his uh, name he cut all the trees down and uh, they drained the chain of ponds and grew wheat. The original um, map of the block, when it was allocated, uh, granted, had, had a label on it, chain of ponds. So near, that's clearly what it was, and you can see the old ponds that were there. And uh, unfortunately, the draining of the ponds extended to become an eroded gully. So what was originally a chain of ponds, by the time we got it, was a very, very bare, deep, um, very dry gully. And every time it rained, water would race down this gully and out the other end and uh, without any contribution to the, uh, the property in between. It's a one kilometre long creek. I tried to get some assistance to do anything with it and they said it's a third order creek and you can't touch it. And so I've been frustrated for the last 10 years not being able to do anything with it. And um, fortuitously, we've now done something with it that's productive. This property has had a long history of landscape degradation and has gone through the classic processes that the floodplains have, have been through in this region. I did some work here a couple of years ago now and we worked at reinstating the old hydrological processes which then underpin the, the ecological processes and provide benefits to the farmer and his production. It's got to be done in an expert fashion. There's no sense in just going out and getting an earth mover and move some earth around and make a bank. You've got to know where, where the water's going to go and that it doesn't create extra erosion by diverting it out and then where it's going to come back into the creek. So Cam has done a terrific job on designing it and done all the levels and worked out where the water's flowing 
and where it will re-enter and it doesn't form, it doesn't go in concentrating in, it flows in over, over an area rather than focused and causing an erosion gully. And that's all been well planned and well implemented and it's working very well indeed. When I first arrived the flow was nearly completely contained within the channel and there were a number of um, erosion sites, head cuts that were eating back into it and content, continuing to eat upstream and extend uh, into the neighbouring property. There are certain places that have passed certain thresholds that just make this work unviable. It'd be too expensive to be able to do the sort of work that we need to do to be able to create connectivity between the channel and the floodplain again. But this landscape, the, the scale of the channel and the width of the floodplain meant that there was enough room and the banks that we put in place, fairly economic to achieve what we wanted to achieve here. So the first thing to do is to map the floodplain, determine the way that the water used to move through it. And there's very subtle topography, even though a floodplain looks flat, there's very subtle topography that shows the path that the water used to take. And there's quite predictable patterns of where water used to move out and back in. And it, and it moves in this sort of a motion down through the floodplain generally. And by working out where the water used to escape, that determines where we put a barrier, put a pond that can lift water up out of the channel and get it back onto the floodplain. Now you've got a lot of risk if it just drops back into a bare gully and so that decides where your next pond is going to be because that can drown the re-entry, dissipating that energy and that, that, that informs our design. And then in between those, those locations there are also other places that we can put small barriers in to create ponds that will uh, form into habit, habitat over time and support a wide variety of creatures. The features that we found here and the, the location of the erosion channel meant that this was really well suited to conducting this work and it was, it was one of the easier places to, to implement it. This was quite a pioneering work and it was one of the first examples of swampy meadow rehabilitation containing a chain of ponds that's been put through the current reg regulations. It's one of the first examples and hopefully things can snowball from here. The more examples we get on the ground, the easier it's going to be for people to do that afterwards. And the more trust the authorities are going to have in the, in the usefulness and the efficacy of this process. So it's a buffer because it, it buffers droughts and floods. It's a sponge because it soaks up that moisture and holds it as a big bank that slowly releases to the catchment below, but also to feed the plants over a longer period of time. And it's a moderator because it just moderates the climate and conditions for all the creatures that live around it. So Adam, we're out here this morning at uh, Jerobomba Wetlands. What do you see when you look around? When I look at these wetlands, I see abundance of food. Mm -hmm. I see plants that we can use for materials to make our shelters and to make our rafts. And, and I also see medicine. Um, mm. There are a lot of um, reeds that are growing in the wetlands yeah. that we can utilise for both foods um, and medicine. Yeah. So um, often, you know, us as Aboriginal people, we see our foods and medicines are the same. What sort, what's think. an example of something that you so, would get out of the reeds? Yeah, so there's um, our kumbungi or yeah. bulrush which has an underground resource or food source um, right. that is um, made into flour for breads and yeah. foods, yeah. Um, full of great nutrients so um, it's really going to fill our, our bodies. Yeah. Um, and also as part of that the, the new shoots um, which are kind of like a salad vegetable that we'll, that we'll collect and we'll eat. Yep. And generally, you know, in a lot of these wet areas too, we find uh, plants that are used medicinally. So um, we call it barbine weed, old oh, man oh, weed, yeah. which is, um, it's kind of a cure-all. So we use oh. it um, for a whole lot of different things. And we find it in a lot of these sort of um, you know, areas of build up where water will build up and then recede, and, and it, it really loves this, this kind of habitat. So, so good for colds, good for tummy good upsets? Good for colds, tummy upsets, um, all sorts of things that you take it internally. It's yeah. even really good for, for your brain and things wow. like that. So lots of different things, lots of different uses for it. So that's your so, secret. That's it, that's right, <laughs> you know.
So. And what about the spiritual side of these places? What makes them special for you? I mean, I, yes. I just love walking through them. I always feel calmer when I'm in them. Definitely. I think uh, water for us um, is is a cleansing thing in itself. Yeah. It's, it's a medicine in itself as well. So, you know, and that's mm. not just for Aboriginal people, everyone that um, is close to water and feels yeah. that connection and that, um, that sort of, you know, that well-being and feeling good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for us, we... You know, traditionally, our ancestors lived by the water. You know, mm -hmm. it was the most, mm -hmm. um, it was the best place to live, basically. Yep. Um, and it wasn't just living by, but following it, using it as pathways through yep. the landscape. Yeah, so it's, a, it's got that, um, the physical, but also that sort of spiritual connection. Mm. So that uh, idea of water is life. Yes, very much so. Yeah, with it, without it, you know, where are we going to be? So yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, very much so, and it's not just life for us, um, but also for our plants and for our animals and everything that it sustains. So. Four years ago, when we moved moved here, um, the lake was about half full. There was actually water in the lake bed. Um, in that time, it filled and dropped and then filled again. But it's been quite warm and windy for the last two months. And as a result, the lake's pretty much dry. We've been pretty lucky the last, uh, it started raining like this this morning, but it's been sort of misty misty stuff for the last day and a half, which has been nice. It's uh, yeah, good to see a bit of moisture about again. We've got uh, 30 acres here. Um, we're lucky enough to have owned two thirds of Green Lake. This is a, a high country lake um, and it adjoins another lake, which is much bigger called Black Lake. It's just a, a wonderful spot with, with, with the lake frontage and uh, just the area basically, um, just having a bit of space. Um, not too much, but a little bit, which is nice. So. They're unique on the Monero. There's something like 200 and more than 250 uh, lakes on the Monero. They vary from ephemeral, which are primarily dry for the majority of the time to these larger named lakes that are, uh, may have water in them perpetually, like most of the Black Lake uh, holds water for a long period. Uh, Green Lake has held water for the last four years, but as you can see this year, it's dried back to uh, a clay pan, basically. Since we bought the place, we've wanted to fence the lake out to preserve it and enhance it. Just recently started to make plans to, to fence it out and remove the stock pressure from the lake to, to let it sort of rehabilitate itself a bit. Um, and have been lucky enough to partnership with LLS. You know, John and Gillian understand the significance and the uniqueness of it. And aesthetically, you know, it's, they've engaged with it. Uh, I think they're bird lovers for a start, which helps, but they can see the impacts that continuous grazing is having on the area. You know, it's great to meet people like that. Without them and all the other adjoining landholders, you know, this, this project would not get up because it needs everybody to be on board. And I think they all think the same. We saw Brad earlier. He's a larger property owner around the area and his willingness to come on board is paramount in the whole thing. And, uh, you know, these guys will maintain that lake for sure, um, hopefully forever and a day. We're going to install a fence that runs around the perimeter of the lake all the way around, 10 metres or so above high water level, and then on mounds like this and the turkey nest in the middle of the dam and a few other selective spots, we're going to do some plantings, uh, going back to the trees that are, that are here already. It's about engaging with the landholder on you know, what, what are their needs and also me getting an understanding of what are the requirements for, say, the wetland itself. As an incentive, we can offer the landholder funding to uh, buy materials. Uh, they use this as a water source as well. So with fencing, they need off-stream water system set up. 
the landholders have the the task of establishing all of that as so it's it's a it's a 50 50 it's more than a 50 50 really if you put over the life of the agreement which is 10 years and understand that it's voluntary they don't have to do this this winter we're going to complete the fencing um, to hopefully do the planting in spring so by uh, october november this project should be complete I just think wetlands are incredibly special. Mm. They're places that are so much more diverse yep. than many other places in the world or in our country even. And um, they're productive, they are constantly changing. It's another thing I really love about them. And uh, the birds in particular, mm. I, I love birds and they are really important places for birds. So what is it that a bird needs from a wetland? Like what does a wetland do for a bird? So obviously it depends what kind of bird you are. Mm. And the great thing about wetlands is that they host a huge diversity of different kinds of birds. So what sort? So they have unusually bush birds, just normal bush birds. You actually use wetlands quite a lot and they might be things like fantails or little finches and birds like that. Um, superb fairy wrens love wetlands even. But um, then we have the water birds yeah. which are actually really dependent on wetlands yeah. um, and they're dependent on them often for their food, they're dependent on them for their breeding, yeah. um, especially species like ibis and spoonbills that tend to breed together in really big numbers. Uh, they um, are really dependent on big wetlands for their breeding areas and they might not breed every year there but uh, when they do they need those wetlands to be in good condition and they need to have water basically in those and wetlands. And so those wetlands, I know you've been doing some satellite tracking. Yeah. So when you look at the satellite tracks, where do the birds go? We've been satellite tracking straw-necked ibises, which are the black and white tuxedo ibises. <laughs> um, we're also starting to track royal spoonbills, which are the big white spoonbills that have massive headdresses, they're amazing birds. Yeah. We're finding with the satellite tracking that they're using private property farms a lot. Uh -huh. um, okay. As they move up and down the entire length of the Murray-Darling Basin, they use farm wetlands as stopover sites. And when they're there, they're basically refueling so that they can keep traveling hundreds, thousands of kilometers. And stopping at these farm wetland sites uh, is really important to them. Getting their food, um, also just having a resting site, it's really important for them to have tall trees, tall eucalypts, fir trees to rest in and to roost in because that makes them safe from foxes, from wild dogs, from whatever else might be trying to get them. So those spots of the farm that we often think are a bit boggy, yes. we don't want to go in there because we'll get our feet wet, yep. are actually incredibly important. Absolutely, and important not only for birds like ibis, but also for uh, what we call cryptic species, ah. which are little bird species, sometimes actually even quite big, that are, are really hard to see. And that's mm. because they're often running around in boggy, marshy, grassy areas. And often they are long distance travelers as well some of them even travel to the other side of the world they might travel half the length of the world and then they'll be using those boggy areas in farmlands um, as stopovers or even to stop and um, settle and be resident This is an intact swampy meadow and a lot of, lot of swampy meadows have been lost from the southern tablelands and the, the fact that this, this swampy meadow has retained its structure and its ability to hold moisture as a sponge is a really valuable asset not just to us as in, in terms of grazing this environment during dry times but also in terms of the environment and also in terms of downstream water users because it holds water. So we're on a property that's called Barlagen, northeast of Braidwood in the Upper Shoalhaven catchment. And I'm standing on the edge of what's known as Bat Creek. It's actually not a creek, as most people think of a creek. It flows down and joins the Mongala River, which then flows in, into the Shoalhaven um, 
which meets the sea down at Nowra. My husband and I have been leasing this property for about nine years now. It's about a thousand acres in size and it's about two thirds bush and a third sort of open country with native pastures. When Pete and I first uh, took on managing this property, our primary purpose was to increase the ground cover and also to manage the serrated tussock with a view to us being able to return domestic stock onto the property in time when, when the property was ready. But we recognised that the, the Back Creek floodplain and the swampy meadow surrounding Back Creek was a really valuable asset of this property that uh, was going to be fantastic for us to make use of in times of need and, and right now is, is one of those times. When it's dry uh, and the ground is a little bit more firm, it's still full of moisture compared to other parts of the property, but it's actually able to take the weight of the cattle and they can make use of all the fantastic green feed that's, that's down in, in the swampy meadow. This is, in, this is important dry time refuge for things like large frogs that essentially need somewhere when they're not breeding and they're not in the pond, they need somewhere to hide. And during the middle of summer when it's stinking hot, you can imagine getting down into the, this moist, thick grass here and being really well protected as a frog. But if you think about a swampy meadow that's actually been incised and drained of its moisture, it's no different to the hillside in terms of the moist environment that it provides for an organism like a frog. We're trying to manage it carefully because we know how useful it is to us as an asset and we pull our water for our stock from this pond here but we keep the stock on the swampy meadow in areas where there are actually no ponds so we're keeping them away from those quite sensitive edges and the, the wet areas. I know that, that it can be really difficult to try and balance the needs of your, of your livestock with the needs of the environment and uh, I appreciate the fact that I'm able to try and do that juggle myself because it gives me better perspective when I'm, when I'm talking to other landholders and farmers about, about their challenges and what they're trying to achieve. The thing about nature is there's repeating processes and it's those that we want to latch onto. And the more that we can just put the old processes back in place, the less that we have to do. And so it's all about making those um, systematic interventions that really work with those old patterns and processes. So when we're walking around our properties or the local community park, we can start to see that there's so much more happening in the environment that we can make even better. We're not saying that these wet parts of the farm or your wetlands or your meadows need to be fenced off and never used again. What we're showing is that you can use these parts of the farm as special but integrated into your overall production system if that's what you want to do. So you can use them to crash graze, you can use them for conservation, a whole range of things. And the really good news is that there's lots of people out there with incentives to help you to do just that. Buffers, sponges and moderators. Buffers, sponges and moderators. <laughs> Buffers, sponges and modulators. Moderators, moderators sorry. <laughs> Buffers, sponges and moderators. <laughs> Buffers, sponges and moderators. It's buffers, sponges and moderators. <laughs> That's fine, that doesn't Did matter. You dare put that in the film. <laughs> so what was the name of this film again? It's a really simple name. Yep. Uh, buffers, sponges and moderators. Buffers, sponges and moderators. Yeah. Sounds like I'm taking my car through a car wash or something. <laughs> no, getting, the, getting the deluxe. <laughs>